Thank you all for joining us for live Q&A with Kasha and Newman from the Data Nutrition Project. This session is a complement to the bite-sized lunchtime talk you've already watched. Welcome back, Kasha and Newman. Once again, Kasha is the co-founder and project lead of the, data, of the Data Nutrition Project, an initiative that builds data set quality standards and tools to mitigate bias in artificial intelligence and a technologist in healthcare analytics at McKinsey and Company. Newman is Director of Art and Education at Meta Lab at Harvard and a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. So uh, let's get started. We have uh, a few individuals who are going to be helping with questions today. Uh, so uh, just like yesterday, uh, whoever would like to jump in first, please go ahead and raise your hand. So I think it's Felix, Richmond, uh, and a couple other folks. So who would like to start us off with questions? Let's jump right in. Let's see. Thank you, Felix. Go ahead and turn on your camera. Hello. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you both for being here. Um, it sounds like you have a really interesting organization and somebody who uses data a lot. I was really excited to, to see people really digging into some of the issues that people often try to avoid. Um, um, so thank you. I wanted to, I guess, get a sense of who in your experience have been your primary consumers or like the people who are most excited for this. So I know you guys talked about data scientists and policymakers, but sort of subsetting down who is really engaging with this. Um, and if you have any lessons that have come from that process, thank you. Sure, uh, I can start. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for having us. It's a real pleasure. Um, and uh, it's nice to see all of you here with us today. Um, it's a really good question about you know who's engaging and where do we see the most excitement? I'd say uh, so far, um, and Newman, I'd love for you to jump in too. A lot of the owners of data sets who are worried about their data being used in ways they don't intend are actually reaching out to us. Um, there's a, probably a little bit of a selection bias there because we put something on our website that said, if you'd like to reach out to us, please do. Um, and that's kind of the way people are finding us. But even through just kind of the grapevine, people are reaching out and saying, hey, look, I work with a lot of data. I have data sets. I'd like to put a label on this data set. Um, I think there is really, there are a number of needs that what we're trying to do addresses, right? If we can do it successfully. Um, and one is definitely on the side of the data set owner and the documenter, right? So documentation is also non-standard as are the tools for validating and assessing quality. Um, and we're trying to kind of do both where we're documentation, but we're also a, a kind of a tool that sits on top of the data set um, that will help you understand how you may or may not want to use that data set for various reasons. But I would say that the, the greatest kind of uptake that we've had is not so much on the data practitioner side of someone who's trying to use the data set, mostly because we're not on a lot of data sets. Um, very much still prototyping and trying to make you know make sense of what makes sense um, but more on the side of somebody who's putting data out there and wants to do it in a way that's going to be um, you know the highest fidelity and has the most information about the data set so that people use that data in a way that feels uh, adequate and correct for the for the intention of the data uh, i hope that it kind of answers your question and I, also newman if you want to jump in and say anything i didn't say um Great, thanks Felix for the question. I guess one thing I would add um, to get a little bit more broad about other audiences um, are, one thing that we found almost by accident is that the fact that we have a metaphor that's really um, graspable, you know, people know the nutrition metaphor. Sometimes it can be confusing because people sometimes think we do stuff related to food nutrition, but um, I think once you understand what it is we're doing and making a, a food nutrition label, so to speak, for a data set, that metaphor carries a lot of weight. And so in addition to data set producers and owners, as Kasha just mentioned, and data scientists who eventually, as there's more labels out there, can reference the labels, we're also, and policymakers, as you said, we're also thinking about journalists or researchers or people who just are trying to understand better what is going into these models that we see so frequently. And if there's a label that's very legible, the way the labels on our food are le more legible than, you know, um, some maybe the technical food science, um, you know, documentation that might go with the production of the food, the labels themselves are legible and, you know, people learn how to read those and understand those and know what they mean. And 
it's not a perfect metaphor, of course, because we're not talking about food, but even the, the way not only is a food label showing the, you know, milligrams of sodium, but also there's on that, in that case, there's a ground truth of like your percent recommended sodium. So you see something and it says, this is like 400% the amount of sodium you should consume in a day, then you can, you know, immediately infer that like, it's probably not really a good idea to eat this, eat this thing in one, in one sitting. And you know, we're hoping that like we are bubbling up through our badges and through the alerts, we're bubbling up this super high level information that even at a quick glance can give somebody more than the traditional documentation that you would see um, associated with the data set. Um, so it has this like educational benefit as well. Um, I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you very much. And uh, we're gonna have a next question from Troy, but before uh, I mention that, so uh, Felix is one of two folks uh, on uh, in this conversation who are Harvard affiliates. So Felix and I believe Kimberly is our second. So uh, hopefully the four of us will be able to meet up. Uh, excuse me, the five of us will be able to meet up uh, at some time when things open back up again. Troy, go ahead and jump in with your question. Perfect. Thank you uh, again for both being here and awesome idea for <laughs> for what you guys have been working on and uh, promoting. I think. As someone that is working and trying to develop my own data sets and databases, I think it would have been really nice to, to have this kind of um, uh, thing available to look at for myself to see um, what standards I should be also making sure that I'm uh, accounting for, making sure that I build a you know a good a, a good database myself. Um, but I am very curious. Uh, so what I'm working on is what I think is kind of a a lack in the field, uh, like there's, you know, we were talking, you mentioned uh, in your presentation, kind of the, the racial bias and like the melanoma project. Um, and something I'm working on is trying to create a more diverse database of facial expressions of pain. But I'm curious, have you guys thought about moving in a direction where, you know, you have these kind of high level labels, which are super helpful, but is there a way for a researcher like myself to see where there's gaps or things missing like in melanoma is there a database that exists where there is a, a data set that includes a diverse set of skin tones or is there not one and then i should help or reach out to people to to build that kind of database great um great question troy so um so just to make sure i'm understanding you're talking about whether like a project could not only call out what's missing in a particular data set that it's labeling, but also point to data sets that are, are better maybe for a particular use case. Yeah, yeah, great idea. So we actually, so, I mean, our label is undergoing a, an, another revision right now because we keep, we keep trying to improve it and make it better. But one of the things that we, we have a section on mitigation strategy. So there's particular, you know, we're calling them alerts that might change to flags or something, but we're calling out issues that we see in the data with regard to specific use cases. And then in some, in some cases, we don't, there's not a known mitigation strategy for dealing with, with a particular issue. And in some cases there might be, and the mitigation strategy might be pulling in um, data from a different data set. It might be cleaning or curating the data in a certain way. It might be not using it at all for a particular use case. I mean, basically mitigate by not doing. Um, and if there's a known data set that's better for a particular use case, or it could be combined in some way, then we'll absolutely point to that because you know we're because that's basically even a better way for us to address these problems is is actually using our platform to point to other to point to good data sets or better data sets for particular use cases. Um, so so yes, absolutely, um, that would be in the mitigation strategy section when we're calling out specific alerts. And we could also think about. I mean, what, once we have more labels on data sets, we imagine having a kind of label repository. So you could also use um, in, a, in a comparison tool where you could actually compare data sets based on their labels to really see for this particular use case, what kinds of issues might I run into with this data set? How about this data set? Um, and so that repository of, of labels will kind of serve as a way to highlight data sets that are maybe better for a particular use case. Um, so I think that maybe hopefully answers some of your question and Tasha, I'm sure can jump into the efforts more. 
Yeah, that's great. Um, the only other thing I'd add is that we have to maintain a, a pretty delicate balance uh, between subjectivity and objectivity, right? So Newman already mentioned with the analogy of the food nutrition label, which ends up being a good analogy in this case as well. Um, you know, when you look at the nutritional label on like a like a hamburger or something, um, it doesn't tell you to go eat someone else's hamburger, right? It doesn't say like, okay, well, this hamburger is like bad in this particular way. So you should probably go eat that hamburger over there. And that's, but it does say compared to ground truth, this is maybe why you wouldn't want to eat this hamburger, right? Or based on if you have this allergy, this is something you need to know about this particular hamburger. Um, now I've like really fixated on this hamburger analogy, like can't let it go. But the, you know, so so we don't really necessarily want to be the people to say you should use this other, you should eat this other hamburger instead. But to Newman's point, we might want to have labels on many different hamburgers and give you a really easy way to compare across them so that you can decide based on your particular use case and the kinds of things that you want to eat, you know, whether or not you want to eat this hamburger or that hamburger. I'm now going to not say the word hamburger for a very long time. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really good question. And we do have to kind of walk that balance um, between giving someone, like telling someone what to do and really just prompting them to think about what they think they should do, right? Because we want to, we want to encourage better behavior, but we don't necessarily know the answer to everything, right? So we might be a little bit more knowledgeable now about melanoma because we worked so closely with Memorial Sloan Kettering on that particular data set and that label. But that's always not always going to be the case that every label that we generate or somebody generates, we're going to know a lot about. We're not always going to know about the domain as well. Um, so, so that's so I agree with Newman with a few caveats that we have to we have to kind of achieve that balance. Thank you so much. Thank you, Troy. Uh, before I introduce our next uh, question, uh, if someone hasn't bought, uh, purchased the URL for Data Hamburgers yet, I think you should. <laughs> or a sticker, perhaps. Maybe that's, uh, maybe that's our mascot for the summer. It's the Data Hamburger. Uh, so we have a question that was turned in in advance uh, that I'll throw out here. And this is for uh, you know, those of us who are going to create data sets, those of us that need to use data sets. But then I know there are probably some entrepreneurs in this space also. So can you talk to us about the challenges that you've come across while trying to create these nutrition labels? for data. And then after that, uh, Yesh will unmute and introduce another question. Great. Yeah, I can jump into that. So the question there is what challenges have we have we encountered while trying to trying to do this project? And the label has undergone a number of uh, iterations. So uh, each iteration, I think, points to some of the larger challenges that we found in the previous. Um, I think the first the first major challenge uh, is in finding something that is going to be useful, but still standard. Uh, and so people who use data, which I assume is most people on this call, um, or who have, you know, have come in contact with data sets, which I assume is everybody on this call, um, knows that there's a lot of different kinds of data. And so the, if you're trying to, you know, create a standardized label, a set of things that are going to matter across all data sets, and then you start thinking about all the different kinds of data that's out there, you see what the challenge is, right? So if you have data sets that are about trees in Central Park, and then you have data sets about people who are in prison, those data sets are very different. And the potential harms of those data sets are very different. So how do you have one standard that kind of um, addresses all of it? That's, that's a major challenge that we have. Um, another major challenge is that a lot of data is proprietary and it's never going to be released out into the public. And so how do you create labels on data that's proprietary? Um, this kind of got to the, the question of, of user really and who our target persona was for helping to generate the label. Um, now DNP, our Data Nutrition Project could be uh, we could be a consultant and go make all of the labels ourselves, but it's not very scalable. And so the question of scalability and who actually makes the label and what kind of access to the data you, you need to have is another major challenge. Um, for example, if we were to talk to a company like Facebook and we want to make labels on all of their data sets that are being leveraged to build their algorithmic systems for the news feed, you know, completely hypothetical there. Um, you know, we, you know, we don't have access to that data. Are they going to give us access to that? Um, and and if, if not, then how do we enable them to create a label on their own data so they don't have to make that public? I would say the flip side of that challenge is an opportunity, which is that the label can act as a proxy for the data set. So they don't have to open source their data or put their data out there, but they can show in good faith that they have a label they've built on that data set, if you believe them, uh, that, that tells you what's inside that data. Um, so that's a second challenge there with the scalability and the, the per, you know, the, the target persona for who's going to create the data and how open it needs to be. Um, I guess I'll, I'll kick it over to Newman if you want to highlight any of the other challenges that we've encountered. Sure, thanks. So yeah, we, there's, there's lots of challenges. So it's a great question and it's, it's great to, we are also happy to share about them so that we can 
others can learn from us and we can learn from others about how to address some of these challenges. I would add the fact that we're making something that's partially qualitative and partially quantitative means that the amount of labor that it requires it's not, you can't fully automate the kind of label we're making because we're in consultation with subject matter experts to make sure we understand the context that this data is being used in. And as a result, you can't just run it through some kind of, you know, script to make the label that, you know, certain, certain parts of it can be automated, but lots can't. And so we think that the label has more value as a result and it's, you know, of higher quality, but it also means that, you know, there's like quite a bit of work to to put in in order to create one. And so that touches on the scale issue that Kasha mentioned, but it feels a little bit like its own thing that we're still figuring out, like which parts can we streamline and you know, how can we collaborate with other experts in the fields to create more of these. Um, an additional challenge that I'll, I'll mention is whether you know, something like this eventually needs to be top down as opposed to bottom up. So right now there's this kind of groundswell of interest in you know, the ethics of AI broadly through whatever you mean by that. And that's great. And we do believe that a rising tide lifts all boats as I think we maybe mentioned in the talk. And there's lots of, we have lots of colleagues that are working in the same space and we're learning from them and likewise. But to get certain kinds of actors or profit driven companies to be incentivized um, by something other than those profits might require more than just wanting to do right. Um, so, what, you know, whether eventually there needs to be regulation, like the way the FDA regulates food nutrition labels is an open question. If it was voluntary and it was like, yeah, we think you should put allergy warnings on your foods. If they have, you know, it's just a recommendation, do whatever you want. Like that might not work so well. And that could be a big problem, you know, for people who have allergies to foods. The fact that it's a law and at least in the US is required like there's certain standards for labeling that are required means that everybody does it. And there's also a way to check if you're doing it improperly or incorrectly or dishonestly. And so eventually, I mean, I think our theory of change is we're really this bottom up approach, but once there's enough um, sort of interest and momentum that, that, that eventually there will be some policies that actually, and we're starting to see that already, you know, policies that are requ requiring certain types of documentation to go along with AI. We're seeing that in the EU and in the US both. So those would I would add as some as some challenges. Yes, go ahead and turn your camera on. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Newman and Cassia, for being here. My name is Yash Tarimola, he him his. I am a second, I just finished my first year as a PhD student at UNC Charlotte. Thank you so much for taking up on the role of nutritionists for our data world. Uh, this is a question that is that I would like to pivot on your last uh, comment that top-down approach and bottom-up need to work in, in like at the same time. I know there's a lot of PhD students who, as a part of their dissertations or research, are using new data sets that they've created as a part of their degree. Like they are saying it's valuable addition to the academic world. Have you seen any discussion of, around that uh, area of like validity of contribution of data set as addition of knowledge and being considered as a PhD equivalent work? Like that could be a chapter or what are the thoughts that are going on at different levels and how have you been a part of those discussions? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, thanks so much for the question. Um, ooh, so with regards to researchers that are creating data sets, you know, in particular PhD students, new research, et cetera, I think there are a few different facets of that question. Um, one is around the reproducibility of research that is that is happening on the frontier, right? Or on the, I don't like that word, on the front line. I don't like that word either. That, that's happening, um, new, new research that's happening. Um, and, uh, we definitely have been in touch with folks who are creating data sets as part of that process. So for example, at the NeurIPS uh, conference, which is a, a, a big conference around CS and has, a, has an AI uh, and kind of um, algorithmic justice focus increasingly, um, they actually cited us as well as a few other potential data standards as um, you know, 
options for how to submit documentation around data sets uh, that support the research. And so we've actually been in touch with a few teams that are interested in building some kind of documentation in the form of labels or others. And we're, you know, actively kind of working with them. Since we have a prototype, we're saying let's work together and maybe prototype the process as well. So that, that's one component there. I think the other part, which is less about kind of having documentation that makes it easy for people to understand your research, and understand the quality of the data is also around the reproducibility, which is to say, do we believe in this data set? Are there things that we need to understand about this data set? So if someone goes and tries to reproduce your research using the same data set, they get the same answers, right? And sometimes when you go to reproduce, uh, the results, it doesn't come out the same, but we all know there's a lot that goes into data cleaning and there are a lot of decisions that you're making when you go through and build an algorithm in terms of feature selection and other modifications or transformations you might make on the data. Um, so being able to spell those out really clearly too in the documentation on a label or in other kinds of documentation, I think is very important for kind of the scientific validity of the research that's being published. Um, I guess I'll, I'll kind of uh, pause there if, if I answered the question, if you have more questions or if, um, if Newman, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I guess um, one thing, Sasha, I think one additional thing I would say is based on your question, Yash, I feel like there's probably more we could be doing to engage with PhD students who are producing their own data sets and writing dissertations sort of about them or that are incorporating them. So we're super enthusiastic for um, folks that have, might, might have ideas or might want to make a label um, for their own data set and then publish that. Um, right now we're working on kind of a playbook for how to make, how to make a label. Um, and we're working with a graduate student at Harvard to do that. And we also have a small grant through the Harvard Data Science Initiative to make some more labels. Um, really working with some Harvard students and PhD students, but we love working with students and all people. Um, this just, this is one grant that happens to be um, through that institution. So if um, you know of people or if you think there's even more we could do, whether it's, you know, putting something out there um, to dissertation, you know, advisors uh, or PhD advisors around this, or even meeting with some PhD students who have created their own data sets um, and helping, you know, create, you know, provide what we have and provide the methodology so that more labels could be made, that would be absolutely fantastic. And it would be really great to get the feedback too from actually trying to make a label for one's own data set um, from, you know, dollars that, you know, in many ways might know more, and certainly know more about the data set and might even know more about the way the data are being used than, you know, any other subject matter expert possibly could. Moderator's preference, yeah. I'm going to jump in with a question. Uh, so uh, I first, um, I, I'd love to, to tell everyone that you may want to ask uh, our speakers about the fellowship program and the affiliate program at Berkman Klein. I have deeply enjoyed being an affiliate at Berkman, Berkman Klein, uh, and, uh, and I know they're always looking for great people. So uh, if you haven't thought about that question, I think that's a good one, just throwing that out, out there. So my question uh, has to do uh, with... Um, uh, uh, intellectual property, so the interaction of the data nutrition labels that you're proposing and, and intellectual property. So many of us are, are creating data sets in earnest, uh, and sometimes our desires for transparency and open source and mass collaboration uh, are, are go before policies at our institutions. Uh, so uh, the, some of our institutions may feel they have ownership of the data that we collect and have expectations of, uh, of some sort of uh, royalty on that, modest as it may be. Uh, have you all interacted with uh, intellectual property challenges at all uh, in, in your work in ownership of data? Because uh, I imagine uh, someone who owns a data set that, that may not necessarily be nutritious uh, may, not, may not want people to know how undelicious that, uh, that data set is. So uh, that, that's my question, and uh, I'll leave that to you. Yeah, great question. I love the use of the analogy. More analogies all the time. Um, uh, I'd also like to point out that we're kind of twinning in terms of our outfit choices in it. So, um, right? It's pretty awesome. Uh, <laughs> this is a great question. And I think there are, are a few different components to it. So, um, certainly the label is trying to bring transparency to a lot of the things that you just mentioned. 
Uh, so one of the major questions that we ask is who's funding this data set. We ask who owns this data set and maintains it. We ask how often it's updated. Because as you pointed out, there are often many different actors that are covering all those different roles. So you might have a data set that is actually collected or curated by, let's say, a consortium of um, entities that then also have IP rights over. So we also ask questions about, obviously, the licensing. Um, but then you might have the fact that it's uh, funded by something else and maybe maintained by a third party or a fourth party or a seventh party. Um, and all of these components matter to somebody who is trying to use the data set for certain things. So we definitely think about IP and kind of lineage of the data set and also kind of maintenance schema of the data set for somebody who's coming to use the data because they need to understand if there are limitations to how they can use the data, whether they're going to have to, you know, pay money for that data. Um, also, you know, who to, who to contact if they have questions about the data. And they might have different kinds of questions. They might need to ask different people. So if it's about the origin of the data set or the curation process of the data set versus some kind of licensing or fee question, those could go to different places. Places. So we've definitely thought about it from the perspective of the practitioner who's encountering the data set and the label aims to make the answers to a lot of that clear and transparent in, in kind of the, the questions that we ask. Um, your question, though, I think is a little bit more on the other side, which is for somebody who is creating the data set and maybe working within the you know, within the academia or within the structures of an organization like a corporation. Um, I would say that we haven't had as much to do with that side of things um, because we're not really, um, you know, we're kind of, a lot of people are coming to us once they have the data set. And then it's really a question of, can we answer the questions about the data set and make sure that that's transparent as opposed to being there at the beginning when somebody is actually building that data set. However, as the expectation maybe increases around having that label available once the data set is published, we hope that people are thinking about these questions earlier in the process. So when they do go to build a data set, they start to think, well, I'm going to have to answer these questions in the future. I should probably try to figure out the answers to them now, as opposed to retroactively once I've finished um, building that data and, and I'm ready to publish it. Um, so I, I don't know if that if that really answers your question 100%. I'd say, you know, we're more of a tool for transparency than like a, um, you know, an operating model or like uh, legal advice. Um, but we are trying to bring transparency to the to the questions that you ask so that people who want to use the data um, know exactly how they can and how they can't. Thank you very guess, much. Yeah. Newman, did you want to jump in? Thanks. One thing is that so there are malicious out there, um, unfortunately. So we're, we're having a little difficulty uh, with your um, with your connection, Newman. Um, so uh, uh, I'll give you a second to get that set. And then um, maybe you can continue answering that question after this next one. You're currently frozen. OK, so uh, we have a question from Maxine, who's a PhD student in linguistics uh, at UC San Diego. Uh, uh, currently not able to turn on her audio uh, uh, because of some noise. So thank you so much for that. Uh, so how do you market this project to people who might not believe or maybe don't care about bias in data or get the information out to people who, um, who use data sets but don't have as much data literacy? For example, physicians who aren't trained researchers. Yeah, I can jump in um, because I don't know if Newman has uh, dealt yeah, with the connection. Perfect. You go ahead, Kasha. Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, so the question was about um, working with folks who are either not super data literate or people who kind of don't want to engage around data responsibility. Um, that's a really good question. If any of you on the call have ideas about that, please let us know. Um, I think, uh, you know, at a meta level, this is where top-down policy helps because sometimes when you have actors who are um, uninformed or malinformed or have malintent of some sort, you, there's nothing you can do that's like voluntary or optional that's actually going to force them to change their behavior. Um, so that's when you have, uh, you know, that's where I think the weight of policy, for example, every data set that is published in the open needs to be accompanied by some kind of documentation that answers the following questions, whether or not it's a label, um, so I think that, that that's where it helps with folks who maybe are reluctant to um, consider the health of their data when they put it out there. And for practitioners, you know, there we did a lot of research into 
the impact of nutrition labels on food because we thought the analogy is good, but it, does it even, does it like, is it sound scientifically? And it turns out that having transparency information on something when you pick it up actually does change behavior. And so I think that even folks who maybe are uh, reluctant as practitioners to look at the health of their data before they build something, we hope there's going to be a cultural shift where there's just kind of the expectation that you do that, um, hoping to influence things like curricula, um, et cetera, so that people who are coming up in the field as well start to realize like, hey, I should actually consider what I'm building and whether it hurts people or at least the quality of that data before I go and build an algorithmic system and deploy it. I think for folks who are just not very data literate, um, our hope is that this label could help uh, maybe bring some light to things that they should be aware of. Um, one, one thing that we saw when we were working with different partners who own data um, is that documentation today can be really uh, intimidating, I would say. We worked with one uh, federal department on a data set that they are publishing and they care very, very much about how people use the data. They cared so much that they actually built a PDF uh, of documentation that was 80 pages long, like eight zero. And if you are somebody who's not super data literate, you take one look at that PDF and you go like, holy crap, like I, there's no way that I'm gonna read that whole thing. I don't even know where to start, I'm overwhelmed. And so our tool is actually an attempt to kind of mitigate that experience, right? Which is to say, we're gonna highlight the things that we think are most important for you to understand about this data set. And if you want, you can kind of like double click and go deeper and you could you could go and get that 80 page PDF if you want to, but the, but the intent is to actually make it really easy to understand the information that that you need to know that's kind of like up top, right? The badges and the alerts that are gonna be standard across all the different data sets so that it helps you become more data legible. Um, so so that's that would be kind of my answer to those two parts of that, that question, right? The people who have kind of malintent or don't really care about data responsibility, in which case top down and culture change probably. And then people who are just not very data literate, well, hopefully our tool will actually help them become more data literate. Can you hear me again? I think maybe if you cut your video, it would help a little. Okay. Nope. I think I lied. I think it didn't really help. There you go, Newman. I think you try again. You've cut your camera and I think it was working there a little bit. Okay. Well, I was just gonna, those, can you hear me? Great, well, yeah, cautious. Much better. Great, well, I mean, cautious can speak for both of us very well, so I trust them and everything that they say to represent the project. But I guess one thing I would add to that answer is that as Kasha said, education is a big part of this. And we're not, it's not only about <clears throat> putting the labels on specific data sets, but really about for those people who don't feel like they care about, uh, you know, bias and ethics right now, we think that there are reasons to care even if they're not motivated by the same sorts of arguments that other people might be motivated by. And through our various, you know, educational and initiatives, including now or cast. So we feel like this will help show caring. Uh, there's a lot of good reasons to care about the ones that be, you know, first apparent. And then before when I was um, mentioning that. Thank you. Mentioning Thank you, Newman. We're having we're having some difficulty hearing you. Um, or I think we're on the every other word plan right now. Uh, so uh, so I'm going to throw it out to Yesh, uh, who has a follow up question, and then Maxine, who can uh, actually unmute now, so get to to meet Maxine. And Maxine has a follow up question. Uh, sorry again for taking up the space twice. Uh, I uh, was wondering if you could share on, so this is something that came up in our discussion today itself in our group working groups, which was when we think about computational social science, we often think about uh, text or notes and the relation between them. I was wondering about what happens when it, the data we're talking about is not uh, text, but it's images, or like if it if it's not uh, binary or not text data. Uh, have you guys thought about it? Like virtual reality, augmented reality, all of these are like NFTs. They're becoming all things. So I was just wondering about 
if you could share how you are interacting with those other types of data and your nutrition data project, how would you label those non-food but food categories? That's such a good question. And we've, um, you know, I think our, um, our work with the melanoma data set was kind of a, a toe in the water there, but to your point, they were still labeled, right? So the instances were still labeled as, you know, melanoma or not melanoma. Um, uh, to, sorry, to give more context in case people didn't see the, the slides before, um, this is a data set of images uh, of, of skin lesions, so pictures of skin, and then they're marked as either being cancerous or not. And this data set is put up on Kaggle, which is a, um, you know, a, a competition site, uh, machine learning competition website. And uh, people are actually paid if they can answer the question of, can you, um, can you predict with some accuracy whether these images uh, are cancerous or not? So I think that was kind of our first kind of dipping our toe in the water there of saying, can we do this for images? Um, but they still came labeled. Uh, and we worked really closely with one of the owners of the data set to, to make sure that our categories were kind of like generic enough that they could capture everything about that data that you could also, um, you could capture about like text-based data or other labeled data. Um, and so, it, I mean, we had to adjust it a little bit, although honestly, a lot of the questions are quite general, like, how did you collect this? Um, you know, did you sample? If so, what were your sampling techniques? Um, you know, are there known issues in this? Um, is there anything that's missing? Uh, which communities are you representative of or not in terms of the instances and the data? And things like, you know, with respect to skin type and skin color in particular was not very representative with respect to the greater population. So that kind of thing got called out. Um, so what I think what you, you end up with with the label is you need a person to kind of help you make that label and translate what's in the data set. Uh, this kind of gets to something that Newman said before, which is that our goal is eventually to have a label that's kind of semi-automated. So some of the components will be quantitative metrics, like let's talk about the distribution of this field, or if you have sensitive categories, let's talk about the distribution of the sensitive attributes, etc. cetera. Um, and that kind of stuff could be automatically pulled if you just like run the data through something, right? But there's always gonna be a component that's qualitative as well, which is like, tell us about the process. Like explain to us, you know, which license this is under. Um, if we have questions, who can we reach out to? Can you explain, you know, the funding models, things like that? And that probably is actually independent of a lot of the data types that you're, the type issues that you're talking about. Um, because it's not really about the data itself, it's about the context around the data. And as data practitioners, I'm sure you know or encountered uh, that so many of the potential harms happen um, when you take data out of context. So the goal here is to put the context back in. So I think for a lot of these data sets that are different, you know, it, there'll be some challenges because especially if they're not labeled, it's like, well, how do you even talk about that? So maybe some of the questions or some of the components of the label won't be applicable, unfortunately. But I do think that a large chunk of it, which is more qualitative, where you're describing the context of that data um, and you're working with subject matter experts and the people who know the data the best. So the curators of the data, the maintainers of the data, you still will have something that will be ultimately we hope, right, uh, useful in the context of, of data practitioners. Um, that's, my, that's my answer to that. I, Newman's back, although I don't wanna get too excited because you never know. Um, do you wanna test out your mic? Newman is uh, on, on, yeah. on cell too now, so I think we've got two Newmans. Yeah, you should only hear, you, can you hear me? You should yes. only hear one of me. Okay, yes. uh, wonderful. Well, I don't have anything to add to that, that Let's, good thorough answer to that question. Kasha let's, gave, but thank you. let's have uh, Maxine jump in with the follow-up question, and then after that is Felix. Hi, um, can you, everybody hear me? Yes, I'm unmuted. Um, thank you both for being here. It's I, I love data and um, care very much about data responsibility and, and bias in data. Um, so my question, my follow-up question to your answer previously is um, you'd mentioned that one of the things that would um, help to improve data responsibility or the culture around data responsibility is policy about data. And so my question is, what kinds of policy do you think would be necessary and how do constituents engage with their legislators about data um, and data policy? That's a great question. Um, Newman, I've been talking a lot. Do you want to jump in first for this? Yeah, sure. So yes, Maxine, great question. Um, 
I think we're we're actually bringing somebody on to work with with us on policy right now, who is currently a fellow at the Green Lining Institute based out of Oakland that does a lot around algorithmic justice and injustice in housing. And I think we're imagining different levels of engagement for this kind of work. So there's state, you know, there's there's state level legislation that we're seeing right now, both for example in California and New York. There's propositions to have better documentation and transparency around using AI. I think eventually there could be some federal regulation um, or even international standards for what's included and incorporated when, you know, somebody's using a certain kind of technology like a black box algorithm, especially if they're not um, willing to disclose or show the data itself, which often, as Kasha mentioned earlier, is proprietary. Uh, how can this be audited or regulated or otherwise, you know, basically steered responsibly? Um, there's some kind of useful metaphors that um, we, you know, people throw around and that we've heard talked about, like, for example, even the FAA with airplane regulation um, or what we see about, so like that's a good example of a global, like there's like this new technology, right, the airplanes. And there's different countries and different companies that are making airplanes. But there's also a lot of regulation that's agreed upon at an international level about what a plane needs to have or to make it safe. And we see the same thing with automobiles, of course, and seatbelts and regulating around that. And there's a lot of other examples. But what we see also historically is that usually the regulation isn't first. Usually there's the harms are seen first and the dangers. And then after we see harms and dangers for a while and we, you know, those of us in the space are starting to start shine a spotlight on that, then we can really advocate for the kinds of broad sweeping change that will keep the most people safe and hold the companies responsible when those those safety metrics aren't met. Yeah, I can jump into and I think that that's all that's all great uh, and correct. Um, and I will I will mention that that's a very like U.S. centric view as well. Um, and we are obviously based in the U.S. I think we're seeing things happen internationally where often it's more principles based or principle led as opposed to harms led. So in the U.S. it's very reactionary. Something happens and then we, we pass regulation because we have kind of an example, a real example of something that happened that harmed a community or a person or whatever. Um, whereas um, the EU, for example, has just passed um, you know some legislation that's more principles based about um, uh, accountable AI and responsible AI. Um, so that's one thing I would point out there. And another thing that I would add is that your question, I think, was you know more specifically around the data. And the data, I think, is one component of this larger thing that Newman was sketching out, which is algorithmic systems and responsible AI more broadly. Uh, and the data is always going to be a part of that. Uh, and I'm I'm happy to see that the data is included in a lot of these dr this draft legislation that's out there. I think people do focus a lot on the systems because that's when you can kind of see the harm. That's the algorithm that's making the decision. And they focus less on the data that was used to build that system or to train that system. And so there were kind of some interesting things that happened in the last few years where, you know, uh, an algorithm that was found to be um, biased, right, they went back to the data, they found out that the data itself had, was problematic. And then there, were, there was a, another move to say anything else that's been built on that data now also needs to be taken down. I think that kind of relationship and increasing people's understanding of the relationship between the data and the algorithm is really important. Um, because you could take that same data and just use it somewhere else and build the next algorithm, right? They'll take that algorithm down, but if you don't go back to the source, um, that's going to kind of replicate itself as an issue every time you use that data, if you don't modify that. Um, so I do think that there's also an opportunity when we think about legislation uh, and policy to focus on open data sets and then algorithms that affect people um, that are being built by federal government or government entities, local state entities. And that's probably where I imagine it will start. So data that's put out there like census data or open city data or, you know, whatever, right? Housing data, um, data that is um, that has to be put out there. Um, will now have to be put out there uh, under certain terms or with certain documentation or transparency. Um, that would be kind of my hope for at least where we'd start with the data. Our next question is from Felix. Go ahead, turn on your camera, Felix. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to ask a follow-up question. And this, I think, ties into the response that you just gave. Um, but I, 
have been thinking about really, I think, the limits of um, these kinds of approaches and was trying to see if you guys had any thinking about is there, is there a point at which you would say like AI techniques are not appropriate for some for some like use cases? And so I'm thinking of like a couple of like reasons why this might come to be. So like ethically, right? You might say like this purpose is like something that we just don't support. Um, for example, preemptively jailing people um, who we think might commit crimes, which is a you know thing that kind of happens a lot. Um, like is there a point where that sort of ethical concern could fit in? And I think the example, another example is you talk about using like previous job applicant data to try and you know um, identify new candidates, right? Um, and thinking about sort of the history of who's gotten jobs and how and all of the sort of ways bias has come into that system. Any enterprise that you know tries to use that past historical data um, to do these future predictions is going to bake that in and there's not really any way around that. It's not like a better version of that data that won't have that problem. And so I'm just curious like, have you kicked the tires on what those limits look like? Would there be a world in which a label would say, don't use it for these things or never, or would the, you know, um, DNP ever take a position of like, we don't support this kind of common um, AI or analytical approach that's happening? Um, or is there always a technical fix and you guys are really just trying to say, how do we get as close as possible? And you're not taking sort of a position on what questions we should be doing. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, let's see many things to say. Um, well, I do think that the kind of ranking or analysis of algorithmic um, systems is definitely something that's happening. So if you look at, for example, the EU legislation, they talk about different risk levels of AI. And they say that, you know, we don't need to um, regulate um, an AI system that is distributing campsites, the same that we need to regulate an AI system that is distributing, um, you know, state resources or, uh, you know, welfare or other support, right? So there, so there, I think, yes, the, the question of, are there things that we should never use AI for or never use data for? Are there things that we totally can? I think that that is the right way to think, where not all AI is equal in terms of its potential harms and impact. Um, I do think that we'll definitely get to a place where we will not be able to use AI for certain things, uh, you know, regulatory wise, right? So you will not be able to use AI to do certain things in times of war. Um, you will not be able to do things uh, that affect certain communities. And I, I hope that we are, are quick to draw those lines so we're not reacting to things that happen, but I fear that we'll be reacting to things that happen before we draw those lines. Um, so I, ab I absolutely do think at the algorithmic level, there'll be things that are illegal, essentially, to use AI for. And I think that there's also a kind of growing body of uh, understanding around where we want to use AI to support human decisions, as opposed to make decisions without humans. Uh, so this is the whole kind of human in the loop scenario where you want to keep a human in um, the decision making process and maybe it's even just AI in the loop where the human is still in charge of everything but the AI is providing um, some support right so saying like oh this uh, appears to be something that you might want to look at more closely because it might be anomalous with respect to some medical imaging so on this scan I'm seeing something that seems a little anomalous I'm going to flag that for a human and then the human will go and actually um, decide what is happening in that scenario, as opposed to saying this AI is just going to make all the decisions medically. Um, so I definitely think that there are both systems that will be, uh, you know, illegal to use AI, and also systems that will always require a human to be in the loop, or actually a human to be in charge, and the AI is only in the loop. Um, with regards to data, it's a little more tricky. Um, we already have in our label, you know, use cases, intended use cases, and kind of anti goals, like anti use cases. Um, so we do kind of come down pretty strongly where it's applicable uh, based on the information that comes from the data set curator. So the data set curator says, or the data set owner says, this, uh, this data set's not intended to be used for X, Y, Z. That would appear on the label. Whether or not we can actually stop people from doing that, you know, if someone downloads the data and uses it for something and then posts that thing online, it's not like we have the power to go and pull it down or sue them or something like that, right? What we're providing is uh, information about how they should or should not use the data set. Um, so we don't really have the power for that. I think that would have to come from the entities that are larger than us. I hope that answers your question. One thing I would, 
Yeah, and one, th one quick thing I would I'd just add to that is I, I really love the question and I think it's really important for, like we're, we're not techno solutionists at all. Um, and I don't think, not that anybody would think that about us because we're basically like, wow, these technologies can be really dangerous and problematic and we should try to, you know, address that by at least informing people better what's in these data sets that are being used to train models. Um, but I think it's really important to even step like to go one step further back and say, should we be even using this kind of technology to, you know, make this make this kind of decision? And, you know, beyond just should we be using this particular data set to train a model? It's like, should we even be using a model for this at all? Um, and I, I think that's a really important question to always be asking. And with any new thing, especially something like AI that has so much buzz and so much hype around it, there's a tendency to think, oh, let's automate or let's build a model or let's throw AI at it. Like that has got to make it better. And I think asking those questions first, like why are we using this kind of system to do this kind of prediction? And recognizing, yes, humans are fallible and biased, absolutely. Okay, anything that's trained on you know, data, it will then also be fallible and biased and basically um, embed those systemic biases that we already see. So there are ways in which you know, a machine can process a lot more data. And so maybe the biases of that system will be skewed differently than human biases, but there's no view from nowhere, of course. And so as Kasha was saying, how can we leverage, you know, the affordances of human decision-making um, alongside the affordances of an automated decision-making process to make, you know, the best decisions possible while also recognizing that not, nothing will be a panacea and there will always be issues that we should always be critically investigating. Thank you. Very much. I think that's a beautiful point to end on. Uh, with three minutes to go, uh, I'm hoping our two speakers, Kasha and Newman, will drop their email addresses in the chat box so our attendees can keep in touch if they would like. Uh, thank you both uh, for joining us uh, for the very first Summer Institute in Computational Social Science at a Historically Black University, Six Howard Mathematica. We appreciate uh, your willingness to engage us in conversation and look forward to following your successes. Thank you. Thank you all for watching. For more information on Six Howard Mathematica, visit our website, follow us on social media, and join our email list.